Okay. Okay, well, let's get started. Uh, welcome everyone and hello, Cetacean Society, San Francisco Bay community. So this is our March of 2022 monthly speaker event. And as most of you know, we meet the fourth Tuesday of almost every month. I'm Susan Hopp. I'm with fellow board member, Bob Wilson. For anyone new to the American Cetacean Society, ACS began in 1967 and is the oldest nonprofit dedicated to the protection of whales, dolphins, porpoises, and their habitat. And we do this through education, community engagement, and grants toward marine research. So we so appreciate your donations in support of our mission. They do fund our grants and support our expenses uh, around these monthly talks. To all of you who donate, a big thank you. So we are recording this session and we encourage you to put your questions in the Q&A. And after the presentation, we'll do our best to get to them. Tonight, we are pleased to welcome our speaker, Naomi Rose, for Beneath the Surface, the Impact of ca Captivity on Cetaceans. Dr. Rose is the Marine Mammal Scientist for the Animal Welfare Institute in Washington, DC. She campaigns internationally to end cetacean live capture, trade, and commercial display, and to improve captive cetacean welfare. She's been a member of the International Whaling Commission, IWC, Scientific Committee since 2000, where she participates in the subcommittees on environmental concerns, small cetaceans, and whale watching. Dr. Rose has authored or co-authored over 45 scientific papers and articles for animal protection publications, as well as chapters in several books. She has participated in various conferences, workshops, meetings, and task forces at the international, national, and state level on topics ranging from the impacts of noise on marine mammals to responsible whale watching to captive marine mammal welfare. She has testified before the United States Congress four times at the Canadian Parliament and at several federal and state legislative and regulatory hearings and has been a TEDx featured speaker on captive orca welfare. Dr. Rose received a PhD in biology from the University of California at Santa Cruz in 1992, where her dissertation examined the social dynamics of free ranging male orcas. She has worked in the marine mammal advocacy field for almost 30 years. Dr. Rose, thank you so much for being here and uh, from Washington DC and especially since it's a bit later, your time. So thank you, and uh, I will hand it over to you. Thank you very much, Susan. Um, I'm really uh, happy to be here tonight. Um, it is 10 o'clock my time, so just forgive me if I start to um, drool or, or fall down face first onto my keyboard. Um, so uh, I'm gonna be talking about the impact of captivity on cetaceans. I'm gonna try to leave it uh, a little bit early so that you can ask, ask questions. There's a lot going on right now on this issue. Um, primarily on the East Coast, but a couple of things happening on the West and internationally, quite frankly. And I, I'm sure that a lot of you have been hearing some of these uh, news items um, in your networks. And so I'm happy to answer any questions about those. So, ah, that's interesting. Let's see how that works out, oh, there we go. So uh, I'm gonna be talking about uh, small cetaceans that are held in captive public display facilities. Uh, most of these are commercial, some of them are nonprofit or municipal, but for the large uh, number, the, the primary, sorry, as I said, it's 10 o'clock here. Um, the majority of the facilities that are out there that we are aware of that you know, you're familiar with are commercial in nature. Uh, bottomless dolphins in the upper left there are the most commonly held species worldwide. There's about 2,000. That's a very, very broad ballpark figure. There could be more, there could be less um, internationally. Um, there's a false killer whale up there in the upper right hand corner that, that's actually more commonly held than you might think, primarily in the east, uh, in Asia. 
Uh, of course, orcas in the middle. Uh, there's only about 60 left in captivity, a little bit less actually, I think a little bit fewer. I think there's only about 58 now um, being held in captivity. It actually was much lower only a little while ago, but as I'll mention, there's been some wild captures uh, which is really quite distressing to think that we've gotten into the 21st century and now we're, we, we sort of regress for a while there. Uh, but we may be correcting course there, so um, I'll mention some of that. There's uh, some Pacific white-sided dolphins in the lower left there. They're not that common in captivity, but they are held, again, internationally. There's a few here in the United States. And then belugas. Belugas are very, very popular for obvious reasons. They are so personable and, and people really, really are fascinated by them. Unfortunately, they are the primary um, attraction in, um, uh, in China, for example, and in Russia. Uh, bottomless dolphins are also very common in those two countries, but the expanding industry in China in particular really favors belugas, and most of those are coming from Russia. So one of the reasons why we focus so hard, the animal community, um, I focus on captive marine mammals and captive cetaceans because I'm a marine mammal biologist. I mean, they're what I know, but the animal community in general has significant concerns about this particular group of animals because they're highly social, they're long lived, they live a long time, all the species do, you know, even the shortest lived cetacean only, you know, only lives 20 years, which is a long time, but the longest lived cetaceans um, in captivity can live to be 80 or 90, not necessarily in captivity, by the way, their lives are shortened by practice, but um, in the wild, they can live to be 80 or 90. Um, they are, uh, they are wide ranging. I think that's actually really an important aspect of their, of their uh, uh, behavioral ecology that most folks don't actually think of first. I, I didn't list it first, but it may be the main reason why they don't um, adapt very well, don't cope very well with captivity. They are wide ranging. And this seems to be the, the main problem for a lot of species that have problems in captivity, whether they're tigers or elephants, um, and of course, all cetaceans really fit that category. Um, but they're also extremely intelligent and we seem to have a lot of, oh, I don't know what to call it, empathy, empathy with uh, intelligent animals. I don't wanna be speciesist about it. I think that there are some very intelligent animals that can cope with captivity relatively well. Um, and then there's some, you know, relatively quote unquote simple uh, species that don't cope with it well at all. Um, pandas might be a good example, to be honest. But um, cetaceans are very intelligent and you know, they're probably at least as intelligent as toddlers, as human toddlers. And that is saying something. You know, they, they, they can um, reason and think and plan and anticipate. All of these things are extremely sophisticated um, cognitive abilities. Um, and as you can see, you know, when we first stood upright, Homo habilis, you know, that's about their encephalization quotient, um, their EQ. So, you know, we are not the top of the, of the uh, evolutionary tree here. We're just one branch. And as far as it goes uh, being adapted to the um, ocean, these guys are, the, you know, are, are pretty ace. And the way I always put it is, you know, we're pretty stupid dolphins and dolphins are pretty stupid humans. You know, we shouldn't be comparing them um, to us anyway. So uh, there are four main reasons why these animals don't cope very well with captivity. And as I first started out saying, what the, the, the one at the top of the list is space. These animals need a lot of space and they don't get it in captivity. Um, orcas are capable of traveling as many as 225 kilometers a day for up to 30, 40 days without rest. That, that's been um, clocked um, with tagged animals that are in the Antarctic. That's phenomenal. And it's not to say that every orca in every population around the world travels like that, but 40 kilometers to 100 kilometers a day is routine. You know? And when I used to work with these animals in the wild, it was very common for them to you know, move about 100 miles in a day. You know, that, that's a wide ranging animal. And at the bottom of each of these factoids, I give you the references for this. Um, this is all, you know, I'm try very hard as a PhD to stay science-based in my arguments and, and you'll see that throughout the talk. Um, the other thing that really can't be accommodated in captivity, as you might imagine, is they're very deep divers. Um, it is extremely normal for orcas to dive in excess of 500 meters a day. Um, a shallow dive for them is, you know, seven meters, that's 21 feet, right? That, that's a shallow dive to them. 
Um, yes, they can come into extremely shallow water. Some orcas even beach themselves when they hunt for prey. Uh, it's, a, it's a foraging technique, a hunting technique that's extremely risky, but they get very good at it. They're pulling pups, uh, seal pups and sea lion pups off the beach, but that's not where they stay. That's not where they spend all of their time. Most of the time they're out uh, a bit off the coast. They, they have also been seen right out there in the deep pelagic zone. Um, they are cosmopolitan in distribution. One of the factoids you'll hear a lot is that they're more widely distributed than any other species except humans. Personally, I think rats are probably right up there. Um, but they are found in all the oceans of the world, um, north, you know, the poles, north and south. They, you know, they are capable of just covering a great deal of ground. Different populations have different lifestyles, if you will. Some of them tend to have very defi well defined home ranges, but an orca home range is going to be hundreds of thousands of square miles. Um, and then that last datum there, I really feel is important to understand why, how much we're restricting them in captivity. They can dive deeper than 150 meters at least once every five hours. And they do. Beluga whales, same sort of thing. They're not quite as um, wide ranging as orcas, but they certainly are capable of covering a lot of ground in a day, um, 60, 70 kilometers. Uh, they are very, very deep divers. They, you know, they're, they're actually deeper divers than orcas are. They, the record now is 900 meters. Um, I don't even know what to do with that. That's, you know, it's 2,700 feet or more. And, and so they dive at least 600 meters um, once a day. So we used to think they were actually pretty shallow divers, shallow livers, if you will. Um, so just imagine how much we're restricting their space when we put them into um, a tank. And then even bottlenose dolphins, who actually, I will be honest with you, adapt better than the larger species. It kind of makes sense. It's intuitive. They're smaller, so they adapt better to smaller spaces. But even, and they are also coastal, largely coastal in their distribution. We do have offshore bottlenose dolphins, but for the most part, they are coastal animals. But even so, the smallest core range, core range, not their whole home range, but the, rain, the core range that they spend their most time in um, is 600,000 square meters. You know, most tanks, you know, you're lucky if they're about, you know, a few dozen square meters in surface area. And again, they're perfectly capable of going down to 450 meters in a dive. So that is much deeper than we thought only a few years ago. Look at some of the, um, the years on the, on the um, references here. One is from 1995, the next is from 2007. We used to think that they were coastal animals, dived fairly shallow, came into shallower water still like 10 feet deep all the time, but they don't. They are actually in very shallow water sometimes and then they move away and then they're in deeper water and they can go down to 450 meters easily. So this is something that we don't give a lot of, um, I think give them a lot of credit for. They move around a lot, all of these species do, and they, they find themselves in different kinds of habitats over the course of a day or, or a month or a year. And so when we only give them the same thing, a tank, you know, that's quite small, uh, we're, we're infringing on their um, autonomy quite, quite severely. This is a graphic I love. It was done by, um, the, the actual graphic was done by an activist who asked, who told us we could, we could use it um, without uh, attribution. So you'll see that there isn't any. Um, but the data itself comes from Cascadia research. So this is a, a adult male orca who went from, and this is, I hope you can see my, my cursor. He goes from left to right. He starts at the surface, he goes down, he does something down there, and then he, can start, he starts to surface again. This entire dive from left to right is about five minutes. Okay? And if you notice, he goes down to 525 feet or 160 meters, and he does something down there. And then he comes back up. And he does this, as I mentioned earlier, he can go down to 500 meters a few times a day. So this is one whale, one five minute dive. He's not just going down to the bottom and coming back up. He's doing something down there, probably foraging for fish, right? These are piscivores. These are the orcas in the Pacific Northwest who, um, who are fish eaters, mostly salmon. Look at this uh, rectangle here in the um, upper corner, uh, sorry, the middle corner of this graph. That, rec that pale blue rectangle, that is the space they are provided that is um, relative to this, this, the scale of this graph, that's SeaWorld. So it's about 30 feet deep and the surface area just takes up this little corner of the graph. 
And yet this is just one dive, one dive, not, you know, his home range. This is a single dive he took one day, but this is the only space they're given at SeaWorld, which is one of the biggest complexes in the world. And there might be up to 10 orcas in that space. So basically what we're talking about is one ten thousandth of a percent. A tank is one ten thousandth of a percent the size of natural home range. If you do the math, that's about a million times smaller, a million times smaller than their natural home range. That's gonna have an effect on them. And again, when I hear the arguments from the industry, from the public display industry that, you know, they only travel this far or only dive this deep because they're looking for food, that's all well and good. That is in fact the evolutionary pressure that uh, resulted in their wide ranging behavior. But it's irrelevant because they have in fact adapted, evolved to roam that widely and dive that deep. So when that is um, taken away from them, when they are kept from behaving in that way, when they're prevented from uh, behaving in that way, it's going to affect them physically. And just think of human beings, um, when we become couch potatoes um, and we stop exercising and we eat fatty foods and all of that, we develop health problems. We are hunter gatherers, we are descended from hunter gatherers. And if we don't stay at least as active as hunter gatherers did back in the day, we will become unhealthy. And that is, in my opinion, exactly what happens to these animals when they're put in a tank. They become unhealthy and their lives are shortened. This is a famous uh, whale known as Lolita or Tokate or also Scully Chakpana. Um, she is from the Pacific Northwest. She was caught in 1970. Um, she's been at the Miami Sea Aquarium for 52 years. She is still alive and her situation has abruptly changed. I won't get into it now, but if anybody wants me to later, um, at the end of the talk, I'm happy to. Uh, as you can see, she has a small dolphin there. Um, uh, there that's a Pacific white-sided dolphin that lives with her. Um, she's really not much bigger than this tank, and yet she's lived here for 52 years. Uh, I, I really don't know what her mental state is now. Um, I'm, a, I'm worried it's not the best, um, but she seems to still be alert. She seems to still be functioning. She's, her health is unknown at the moment. Um, again, there's things happening at Miami Sea Aquarium at the moment that some of you are probably familiar with. I won't get into it now but her circumstances may be changing, which is gonna be a little bit strange to see how that plays out. Belugas, uh, th there's seven, I believe, seven animals in this photo. This is from China. This is very common. You know, it's, it's run down. This, this facility is probably actually only about 10 years old and it immediately starts to decay. The paint chips, the concrete degrades. This is salt water. So, you know, it's corroding everything and they really, their building standards are very poor in China. So putting seven animals into this small holding tank, you know, see, it's just, just this wide. This is where they spend most of their time. Their, their actual performance space is bigger, but they aren't allowed to stay in it uh, in between shows. So the circumstances in China are unfortunately quite grim. They get most of these animals from the wild. They really don't know how to keep them alive very long. They die and then they go back to Russia and get more. Now the, the trade, the, the um, chain of trade from Russia is currently um, broken. There is no trade going on from Russia at the moment, which is something that activists accomplished. So we can take a lot of pride in that. Um, they are currently not capturing either species, either belugas or orcas from the Sea of Okhotsk right now, which is really something, um, but I don't know how long that will last. We can only hope, especially with what's going on in Russia right now, um, that that trade is permanently ended. Um, that means that the situation in China may change as well, may shift uh, for the better, I hope. But again, to be determined, we really don't know what's going on there at the moment. Um, dolphins, bottlenose dolphins, this is in Taiwan. Um, that's not unusual either. These small uh, circular tanks were very popular in the 1960s. They're completely inappropriate, you know, beyond belief inappropriate, but they were quite common. Um, and in the certain sort of smaller facilities in Asia and uh, um, Southeast Asia and so on, it's still quite common to find them. They're pretty much gone in the United States, except for a couple of places. Um, but even the modern facilities really, you know, they're not much bigger than this. So space is the really big problem that they face once they're put into captivity. Then we have social groupings. These are highly social, socially complex animals. Um, their bonds, uh, whether they're kin bonded or whether they're just friendships, reciprocal altruism and all of that, 
they're very important to them. Their social bonds are very important to them. And what we give them in captivity is, you know, not this, right? This is what's natural to them. These are belugas, these are bottlenose dolphins, these are Pacific white sides, and these are, of course, this is a family of orcas in the Pacific Northwest. This is a very tightly kin bonded group. This is a uh, what we call a fission fusion society of bottlenose dolphins. Same thing with belugas, a bit fission fusion, some family bonding, uh, matrilineal groups, you know, the descendants of a single female tend to uh, show site fidelity. So they come back to the same um, foraging grounds and the same feeding grounds year after year. Um, that means that there's some uh, kin bonding going on. Pacific white-sided dolphins are way out there in the pelagic area, and we probably are looking at a fission fusion society here too as well. Um, all of that's not preservable in captivity. All of it is you know, taken away from them and they are, they are being held in artificially, uh, artificial social groups in, in captivity. So this is what you more likely might see. This is actually Kiska in Canada. This is actually a terrible situation. She is completely alone. At least Lolita Tokite has um, dolphin companions, even though they don't tend to get along all the time. She has nobody. They did try to put another species in there with her and she attacked them. You know, she used to have other orca companions. They all died or were sent somewhere else. So she ended up being alone. This is not how she's always lived. So now that this is the, the way she has been living for the last 10 years, I can only assume that, I, I'm actually astounded she's still alive. I would have thought she just died from depression because she is depressed. This is very common for her. She logs a lot. She just spends a lot of time at the surface doing nothing. Sometimes she goes down to the bottom and does nothing. She really doesn't get a lot of exercise. They don't have a show for her. They don't, they don't do anything with her as far as I can tell. This is, um, in my opinion, pretty, pretty cruel. You know, it's not just inhumane, it's cruel. Um, but unfortunately, the new law in Canada, which is great, there's a new law in Canada that has completely outlawed the public display of whales and dolphins. Huge, again, a huge success for the activist community. Um, but they grandfathered in all of the existing captive whales and dolphins. And, you know, that's not going to be an unusual situation. The more successes we have with legislation, grandfathering in the existing animals is going to be fairly common. And so her situation is, you know, likely to be unchanged unless, again, something else happens in the future, such as sanctuaries, which I'll talk about at the very end. This is a typical, you know, exhibit. Again, this is in China. There's only two belugas in it. That's very common, two to four belugas in a single enclosure, or, you know, at the most eight, perhaps, you know, and you saw in the first photo of the natural groupings, they can um, aggregate in groups of a, a thousand or more. So that's a village and what they get in captivity is less than a family. So it's, it's not normal for them. Um, these two, uh, I don't even know if these bottomless dolphins are still alive. This was in Jamaica several years ago. Um, again, a pair of swim with the dolphin dolphins in Jamaica, very common grouping to find. Um, in some other locations, you might have 10, 12 dolphins. Again, what's normal is a fish infusion society of anywhere from 100 to 1,000 bottlenose dolphins. So two to 10 is, is not normal for them. And, the, and you have to understand that some of these circumstances, these animals don't actually get along and they can't escape each other. So we like to think that they're friends, but they may not be. And in fact, we've had a couple of instances where it's become quite clear that the artificial social group that we made them live in by putting them in a, in, in a tank like this or in, in a, an enclosure like this, when they were allowed to choose where they lived, you know, you know, or whom they lived with, they separated. So they actually didn't get along. They only coped with each other to avoid injury and so on. And in some cases, they've actually fought to the death. That doesn't happen in the wild. Whales and dolphins, even orcas, you know, which are, you know, sometimes uh, they do, are aggressive with each other. The aggression never escalates to death. It 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 doesn't with most mammals, let alone marine mammals, you know, it it's, wouldn't be terribly adaptive if it did, because the loser can run away. But in this sort of situation, the loser cannot run away. And so we've had a number of instances in captivity where one dolphin or one whale has killed another. And in fact, that's one of the things that's going on in the Miami Sea Aquarium right now. Three dolphins have died in the last two years due to aggression, interspecies, intraspecies aggression, conspecific aggression. In other words, a captive dolphin killed another captive dolphin three times in the last two years at the Miami Sea Aquarium. 
Environmental quality and complexity. Again, the ocean versus a swimming pool. You know, they, they just lose that. We, we take it away from them. They, they don't have a lot of uh, variety in a tank. And in fact, a lot of people think that their echolocation um, is problematic for them in captivity. They don't use it because the, the echo, the um, clicks that they make echo off the walls in a way that drives them crazy. That's actually not necessarily true. Um, in some of the more modern tanks that are actually designed to uh, dampen that kind of reverberation, uh, it's not a problem for them to use their echolocation. They will use it if they're asked to, and they'll use it very, very precisely. But they don't tend to use it spontaneously because why would you? It's the same tank day in and day out. Nothing ever changes. So why would you use your echolocation? That's overkill. You can just see it. The, the tank is painted like blue or white, and you can see perfectly well they, they have very excellent eyesight. And so why use your um, echolocation? At, at, that's bringing a, a, a gun to a knife fight. You know, it's just not necessary. Um, and so they, uh, they actually just are bored, I think, for the most part. That's really the problem with their enclosures. It's not so much they're being driven crazy by their echolocation or they're, you know, um, slowly being driven crazy by boredom or, or, or by um, uh, isolation or because normally they live, they live with other animals or even fighting. It is boredom. So, you know, it, look at that. That looks like a hotel swimming pool. You know, it literally has no features. It has it's painted like blue, just like a, a swimming pool. It they're living in a hotel swimming pool that's filled with salt water. Um, you know, it's as boring to them as it would be to us. You know, to live in a room that has absolutely no pictures on the wall, no television. You know, no not even any furniture. You know, while sitting on the floor. I mean, you know, it it's not normal. It's not interesting. And these are intelligent animals that I think can be very easily bored. It's one of the reasons we think they, they chew on the walls and the gates and, and injure their teeth, which you'll see in a minute. Um, this uh, beluga, again, uh, was in China um, in a facility that's actually inside a shopping mall. And uh, again, I'm happy to give you more details later, but it, it's kind of bizarre to think of an entire marine aquarium with marine mammals inside a shopping mall. There was one in Canada as well, but it was um, bottlenose dolphins and sea lions. These are belugas, you know, and they're in this very small tank inside a shopping mall. Um, what these two belugas are doing is nothing. They're laying on the bottom of the tank and they're doing nothing. They only come to the surface to breathe and then they drop back down to the bottom, one with its belly down, one with its belly up, and they just lay there. That is not normal in any, any sense of the word. That is not what they do in the wild. Um, certainly when um, cetaceans rest in the wild, they might um, log at the surface. They might become motionless for a while. And for a while, I mean up to five minutes, perhaps two minutes, three minutes, but then they'll start moving forward again. You know, you need hemispheric sleep as most of you might've heard. They shut down one half of their brain at a time. They are still swimming and they're still swimming forward and one half of their brain is still mostly alert so that they can avoid things like vessels, you know, in the modern era, but historically, you know, predators, sharks, other, you know, killer whales. So they basically have half of their brain awake at any one time and they don't stop swimming. Um, it tends to be one of the more social activities for social cetaceans. They group up in a family or they group up in a in a, 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 a social group of some kind, and they all do the same thing. They slowly rest, they slowly drop into the resting state, but one half of the brain is awake. And there's usually a scout, if you will. One animal is actually more alert than the others, and they will wake everybody else up if it becomes necessary. This complete inertia, just not moving at all, lying on the bottom of, I don't know, in this case, it would be the ocean. Yeah, they don't do that. That is not something you see in the wild at all. Um, Poor water quality. This is a facility in the Caribbean. There's a lot of runoff here. You can sort of see that this is just runoff from the, from the land here. And then these are the, the actual enclosures. There's, there were three. This is a facility that has long since closed because of the pollution. They, they actually blocked off a, a storm drain that was draining all of this land up here. And you can see there's horses here. You know, this was, you know, um, when the storm drain was operational, there was a lot of um, iffy water, you know, in rainy seasons, for example, when it rained, I'm coming into this little bay here. 
Uh, they actually noticed that the facility, so they blocked it off. They, they blocked the storm drain off with a tarp and rocks. And when the rest of their neighbors, the farms and the uh, uh, businesses around the, the Dolphinarium, realized what they were doing, they, they, called, they called the authorities and, and eventually this place was closed down because they were actually causing flooding and all sorts of problems. Um, but it didn't really help because the runoff was still causing a problem for the dolphins who lived here. And, and, th and this is an unusual. You know, any CPEN facility can have really poor water quality. In fact, in the United States right now, we have a facility in St. Thomas that's living it, that's existing in a body of water that fails its Clean Water Act um, standards for human swimming 40% um, of the year. So these dolphins are now living in this body of water that is not safe for human swimming. It's a, it's a swim with the dolphin program. You know, it's St. Thomas is the United States. Um, it's the US Virgin Islands. And so they're subject to the same law as any US facility is. And 40% of the year, it wouldn't be safe to put swimmers in the water with these dolphins for a swim with program. And yet it was permitted. Uh, all of the necessary permits to build this sea pen um, in this body of water were given under the Clean Water Act, under the Net, um, Marine Mammal Protection Act, and so on. And it never should have been allowed. And this facility is now, um, you know, operational. Um, I don't know how it's been affected by the pandemic. Um, my understanding is it's not been doing a great business. I don't know if it'll survive. And then what, what will happen to those dolphins? Behavioral restrictions. And this is true for any zoo animal especially any wide ranging predator. Obviously predator prey relationships are completely disrupted. They are fed dead fish. No cetacean is a scavenger. No cetacean um, feeds on carrion. They, they feed on live fish or other you know, live marine mammals. And so to turn them into what is essentially a scavenger, again, is not good for their, their health. Uh, the nutritional value of frozen fish is you know, lesser. It's not as uh, nutritionally valuable as a fresh living fish. And um, they don't get a lot of variety in, the, in what they're offered. You know, it's usually mackerel or herring. Um, sometimes the, the fat content of a fish that they're fed in captivity isn't, isn't appropriate and so on. You know, basically they're getting fed quote unquote restaurant quality fish, but it's not species that are the best for them. So often they're supplemented with vitamins and so on. And it's just, it's just kind of a vicious cycle if you ask me. So, you know, orcas are the top marine predator in the marine environment. I mean, we, we, we like to think of ourselves as them, but, you know, most people wouldn't want to get into the water with um, a mammal eating orca for good reason. Um, I don't think they've actually ever been recorded as killing a human being in the wild. Um, in fact, somebody tried to look up any instances going all the way back to Greek ancient history, and they couldn't find any records of any orca ever killing a human being and having it be you know, verifiable in the historic record. And yet that's their reputation, they're wolves of the sea. Um, and that's because of what humans observe them doing to other marine mammals. And then of course, there's the vegetarian orcas, if you will, they only eat fish, but they got a bad rap. They're all considered vicious predators. But in fact, they are the top marine predator. There isn't anything even that will necessarily attack a calf. You know, they, they, they protect their calves pretty well. So, you know, they, they are the top of the food chain, as it were, in the, in the ocean environment. This is what you'll see. These are mammal eaters. You know, you're going to see this is that shallow water foraging, um, beaching yourself and pulling pups off the beach, seal pups off the beach, sea lion pups off the beach uh, that I mentioned earlier. This is in Patagonia um, in South America. Very, very skillful. I mean, they have to learn how to do that from juveniles on up. They, they can't just do it they'll beach themselves and, the, and they'll die. You know, they actually have to learn how to do this. It's a trial and error method. And occasionally I do think they do lose an, uh, a juvenile or two, you know, to learning how to do this. So it's a, it's a dangerous, but, you know, high risk, high reward foraging behavior. And down on the lower right, the, the lower uh, right photograph, you see um, a transient orca in the Pacific Northwest. I think it's actually in Alaska, uh, hunting a doll's porpoise. And they just absolutely blast them out of the water. They, they, they ram them, they go flying. It takes them a while to die, it's a little bit grisly. Um, and sometimes when they finally kill the animal, they burst them open. Again, I'm not trying to gross anybody out. Sorry if you just had dinner. Um, they burst them open and, and they, they gut them basically. And then they eat the fat and then they come back for the viscera. And if you are there when that happens and you pick up the viscera, 
somebody I know, a, a researcher I know, actually found um, uh, Bell's porpoise heart still beating. You know, the, the, the stomach, the lungs, everything was attached with mesentery and the heart was still beating. That's how fast they do it. I'm trying to impress you with these are the top predators in the ocean environment. And then this is what we reduce them to. This is soliciting fish in captivity. This is an animal that is, is a fish eater. This is Lolita. She's actually from a fish eating um, habitat um, and population, but still opening your mouth with your head out of the water is a captive behavior. If you ever see a picture with a cetacean with its head out of the water and its mouth closed, it could be in the wild or in, the, in captivity because that's spy hopping. They do it in the wild. It's a normal behavior. It seems to be, you know, for looking at landmarks on land, they have very good eyesight above and below the surface of the water. So spy hopping, perfectly normal. But if their mouths are open, then they're in captivity because why would a wild cetacean ever open its mouth with its head out of the water? There's absolutely no, no reason to do it. Fish don't fall from the sky in the wild. They are underwater with, with the cetacean and they're hunting them down there. Fish fall from the sky in captivity. It's a completely abnormal um, foraging behavior. It's not even foraging behavior, it's just a feeding behavior. And it actually affects their eyes. They um, are looking up into the sun and if they aren't provided adequate shade, the human being is fine. They're looking down at the animal, but the animal's looking up at its trainer and actually ends up getting eye opacities and, and eye um, injuries from, from excessive solar um, exposure. So here you've got um, common dolphins herding. Um, I, I, I'm assuming these are like anchovies or something. They're actually fish herding. And this is a group cooperative hunting behavior where they actually bring the, the fish into a tight school, a tight ball, a herring ball, if you will, or, or an anchovy ball. And then they take turns you know, picking the fish off. So everybody wins if they cooperate in this way. And again, this is what you get in captivity, just heads up, mouths open. You will never see a wild dolphin doing that. This is just, you know, one of those silly things that some um, foreign facilities, uh, this is in Korea. Um, th this era has passed in the United States, but we used to do it all the time. We would put sunglasses on them or costumes on them or surf on them. But in um, these Asian facilities, this is still very popular. So this is a beluga in Korea and surfing them this way is just very popular with the audience. You know, we have a lot of work to do in, um, in Asia to try to educate the public to have different expectations of these animals. They basically still want a, a loud circus show. And, and so um, this isn't entirely the facility's fault other than the exploitation in the first place. They're giving the audience what they want. But you know we need to um, educate the public just as we did over decades here in the, in, the, in the West to have different expectations and hopefully ultimately have a Blackfish moment Blackfish being the documentary that was released in 2013, um, where it's a, it's a sea change, where the public actually not only has different expectations of captive cetaceans, but doesn't want them at all. They, they don't want them to be in captivity anymore. We, we need to still work on that in the East. It's, it's happening very, very rapidly, actually, in the West. So what is the impact on, on cetaceans? You've seen the different... Um, Impact, the different uh, conditions that they have, you know, space, social groupings, um, environmental complexity, uh, and so on. What, what happens to them when, this, when they're subjected to these conditions? So one of the things that I found just by chance, really, um, when I was working on a white paper on this issue, um, you know, putting together, you know, all the research I could find and, and developing arguments against the practice of keeping marine mammals in captivity, was that bottlenose dolphins actually suffer from a disease called hemochromatosis 15 times more than wild dolphins do. Um, and this work was actually done with the Navy dolphins. And hemochromatosis is a disease of all mammals. We can get hemochromatosis. It's an excess of iron in the blood. And it's dangerous. It can have a lot of different impacts, including death. So it's not um, necessarily fatal, it's, it's a treatable disease, but it is, you know, a health risk and can lead to death. So it's not light to be taken lightly. They are 15 times more likely to develop hemochromatosis in captivity than in the wild. That to me was like, wow, 
Are, what are they doing about that? You know, are they studying why? Like, why do they develop hemochromatosis at such high rates? Well, actually, almost nobody studied that. They did discover it probably had something to do with their diet um, or their activity rates, but they were more interested in what it meant about human physiology and using them as models for the study of diabetes. Hemochromatosis is a complication of diabetes. And so um, they decided to use them as models for developing diabetes treatments. And I, I found that really quite shocking. Um, rather than being concerned about the impact it had on the health of the animals that were suffering this condition, they decided to exploit it for you know, pharmaceutical purposes. And again, of course, we all know how our health system is and it's a for-profit industry. And so they were making a lot of money on it. Um, interestingly, uh, the way they treat it in dolphins, because they do have to treat it, you know, as I said, it's a dangerous disease. It can be a dangerous disease, is um, phlebotomy, which if you're familiar with that term, it means bloodletting. They literally bleed the dolphins periodically to drain off the excess iron in their blood. You know, this is like something out of the medieval horror, you know, era when, you know, leeches literally were put on your body to bleed you because that your humors were out of whack. Um, this is what they do with captive dolphins to treat them when they develop hemochromatosis. They bleed them. That's the best they can do for them. Belugas don't breed well. This is actually an interesting phenomenon. All the other species of dolphins, belugas are not dolphins, they're monodontids. The, the delphinids breed okay in captivity. Even orcas breed okay in captivity. It's, it's a mystery to me. Um, here's the rule of thumb. If a species does not breed well in captivity, there are problems with them being in captivity. It is affecting them to the point where they can't even breed well. But breeding well does not mean they're adapting well to captivity. Just think about, well, I, I won't get too emotive about this, but just think about um, uh, puppy mills. You know, those dogs are being kept in horrible conditions, but they'll keep popping out puppies. So breeding is such a, a strong physiological, biological imperative that they will reproduce even when the conditions are bad for them. Um, and I think that's the situation with most delphinids. Um, but with monodontids, they can't even pull that off. And that means there is a real problem for them. So they don't breed well in captivity. They do breed, don't get me wrong. And they've even developed artificial insemination for belugas, but it's not, um, it's not readily. They do not breed readily. And so in fact, the um, beluga population in the West is declining to the point where it's not sustainable anymore. Um, you may have heard that the Georgia Aquarium wanted to bring in 18 wild-caught Russian belugas um, back in 2012. And the reason they wanted those animals was because the captive population was declining at such a rapid rate. It simply wasn't reproducing. Animals were dying faster than they were being born, that they were entering a, a, genetic, a genetic bottleneck, let alone a, a you know, population crash. So there are only about 30 captive belugas left in the United States. Um, there used to be as many as 50. And now they're down to 30 because they just are not, they're dying faster than they're being born. They are being born, again, don't get me wrong, but not um, sufficiently. And again, that's not true for bottlenose dolphins. Bottlenose dolphins actually breed at a sufficient rate to replace those that die. So there's been a very stable population of about 400 bottlenose dolphins in the United States for decades. And 400 is a pretty normal genetic pool. Um, you know, there are lots and lots of dolphin populations out there, bottlenose dolphin populations with only 400 dolphins in it, only 100 dolphins in it. Um, and, and they manage not to have inbreeding depression. So that's bottlenose dolphins, but belugas don't breed well. Um, and then there's the dentition problem. I mentioned that uh, these animals get bored. That's probably their number one problem. Boredom leads to depression, depression can kill. Uh, stress can kill. Um, and so how do we know that they're bored? Well, this is one symptom of that boredom and stress. They develop stereotypies, right? They, they do things like horses crib on their stall walls when they're bored. Um, these animals crib, basically. They chew on the walls and they chew on the gates. And so you see a resident here on the left with these beautiful conical shaped teeth. This animal obviously stranded and is dead but the teeth are in great shape. Um, and then you see this, this is a tilicum, by the way. Um, his teeth were ground down to the gum line. This animal, I actually don't know which one this is, um, has broken teeth here in the front and on the side um, here on the upper jaw. No, more, normally, as you can notice, that the upper jaw is actually in slightly better shape. That's actually pretty normal. It's one of the ways you know this isn't a normal 
condition. There are some wild orcas who have their teeth ground down to the gums, but it's symmetrical. Both the up, upper teeth and the lower teeth are exactly the same. They're wound, uh, ground down, well, not ground down. They're worn down to the, the gums. And it turns out that these are animals that suction feed. And so just like the Grand Canyon was carved out by a, you know, a river that you know, slowly eroded the sides of the canyon, their teeth are slowly worn down by the water that rushes past as they suck in a fish, suction feeding. And only a few populations do it. And those populations have teeth like this and they may actually have shortened lives because once your teeth get like this and they're basically open cavities, you're just inviting bacteria and pathogens in and developing systemic infections. Um, this broken tooth problem, this asymmetrical broken tooth problem is not seen in the wild anywhere. This is purely a captive problem. And what I find fascinating about that is they've never studied that at all. The industry has never studied that at all. What's the other thing they've never studied? Collapsed dorsal fin of orcas. Some of the other species develop this problem as too. This problem too. They've never actually studied these abnormalities, these anomalies that are clearly a function of the captive condition. There's no papers on them at all. The only dentition paper we have is one that was written by, look at the authors, John Jett, Ingrid Visser, Jeffrey Ventry, Jordan Walsh, and Carolina Locke. Carolina Locke is an actual um, dentition expert for cetaceans. She is an honest and you know, objective scientist. And she agreed to work with these um, four folks who are also very good scientists, but you know, they have an opinion. John Jett and Jeffrey Ventry are ex-trainers. They were featured in Blackfish. Most of you folks may know Ingrid Visser. She is a very strong opponent of captivity. And Jordan Waltz is a researcher. Um, she does a lot of, she was one of the researchers for Gabriella Cowperthwaite and Blackfish. And so when I say researcher, I don't mean a scientific researcher. I mean, she's really good at finding um, uh, documentation um, using the inter internet. So she found a lot of the, the data that they use. They could not get access to the animals or their medical records. Seawold, of course, would never have allowed it. So they simply went in there with a high powered lens and they took photographs. So you can see again, worn down, broken teeth, serious impaction, serious infections. Uh, it turns out that 69% of, you know, roughly 70% of all orcas in captivity have serious uh, dental abnormalities that they are, that are self-inflicted based on chewing on the walls and the gates. Um, that is not, as again, you know, that's not true in the wild. You know, you've got populations with beautiful teeth and you've got populations with worn teeth that are symmetrical. What you get in captivity is asymmetrical and it's 70% you know, of a single population. And it's not because of the way they feed. Again, the, the, the populations that have worn teeth in the wild are suction feeders. These guys, the fish never even touch their teeth. They, they're just tossed down their gullet, you know, dead um, when they have that head up, head up mouth open um, behavior. So it's not from feeding, it's from chewing on the walls. But you will actually hear a facility like SeaWorld tell the public when they ask about their teeth that it's from handling objects like their toys, which are rubber, plastic, or rope. And, and, and I assure you, this is not what's common. Um, Lori Marino and myself, Ingrid, uh, and, a, and a few other colleagues, Heather Rowley from PETA, who is a, a marine mammal vet who's very strongly anti captivity, and a couple of actual medical doctors. We looked at um, all of the impacts that I've just mentioned, things like diseases, um, tooth abnormalities, and so on. Um, and we put them all together, and we basically came up with a model on what would cause all of that. And the bottom line is, remember I mentioned stress, you know, what happens to us when we're stressed out all the time? We develop a lot of health problems. Well, so do they. So just being in captivity when you're so such a big animal, whether you're a beluga whale or um, an orca or a pilot whale or a false killer whale, when you're a large dolphin or a monodontid, you are going to be chronically stressed, not acutely stressed, which is a fight or flight reaction, which is survival of the, you know, it's a survival behavior, survival reaction, and isn't necessarily harmful, you know, you're running away from a predator or, you're, or whatever. This is chronic stress that becomes a problem. It becomes a problem for any mammal that suffers it, including human beings. You know, if we are constantly stressed, chronically stressed, we develop high blood pressure, we develop ulcers, so on. 
This is something that happens here in um, captivity as well. We believe that is the model that makes the most sense. Being in captivity, just the very fact that you're in a concrete tank that's too small for you is going to lead you to chronic stress and then will lead to your medical problems. Um, we did look at survivorship over the years. It has been improving. Um, what I find fascinating is for those animals where it has been, for those species where it has been improving, it's, it reaches a plateau. Um, they may end up surviving just as well as wild dolphins in poor situations. So here's an example. Orcas have had some improvement in their um, longevity and their survivorship, but it topped out basically at a rate that was equivalent to species, to populations, I'm sorry, that are endangered or threatened. So the conclusion is that captivity has improved. You know, they've improved husbandry. They've tried to keep them interested and engaged and not bored and so on. They have improved that over the years. But at some point, just being even in the best facilities, quote unquote, best facilities in captivity has the same impact on the animals as degraded habitat that leads to endangerment or threatened conditions in a population. And that paper, by the way, this reference down here was actually a SeaWorld paper. They claim that their results showed that their animals, because they only looked at SeaWorld animals, which is about 65 individuals um, over the years. So they, they found that their animals survived at about the same rate as populations in the wild. What they failed to tell anybody in this peer reviewed paper was that those populations that they were comparing their whales to were threatened and endangered. So in other words, captivity has impacts that are equivalent to whatever's going on in you know, the Southern resident killer whale population, for example, which of course is starving to death. So you know, that is nothing to write home about, but they did, they, they, they spun it so that it sounded like, hey, our whales live as long as they do in the wild. What I also do find interesting about that conclusion is, okay, fine, even if it was true, and this was a healthy population that wasn't endangered or threatened, it was thriving, you know, it was robust, and they were living as long as those, that population. Generally speaking, in zoo animals, they live longer than their wild counterparts because, for, if nothing else, you take away their predators, right? Take away um, mortality from being somebody else's lunch. And so, you know, even when you're thriving um, in the wild, nature red in tooth and claw, you, you might become, you know, you might die, you know, before your time because something eats you or because you fell off a cliff or because there was a bad winter or whatever. So there are sources of mortality, even in a robust, healthy population that are natural, that are not human caused. And once you're put in a zoo, whether you're a giraffe or a zebra or whatever, you tend to live longer because you're not somebody else's lunch. But even predators, who are not stressed out by being wide ranging tend to live longer. So for example, um, species that don't wide, widely range, that have small home ranges, but are predators so like small cats, they actually do okay in zoos. And again, I'm not advocating for zoo, zoo ex exhibition of small cats, but I'm just saying it's a fact that they tend to live longer than their wild counterparts. But big cats do not because big cats are wide ranging. And when they're not allowed to range widely, they develop these health problems, they pace, they show stereotypies, they get stressed and they die younger um, from these captivity related conditions. Same thing is happening with um, whales and dolphins in captivity. Okay, they, they are not being, they're fed normally, uh, sorry, fed regularly. They never have bad winters where they starve. Um, they're not being impacted necessarily by all of the ship strikes and, and entanglement and fishing gear, all of those things they're protected from. But just being in captivity itself, because they're wide ranging and they can't range widely in captivity is stressing them out. And so they tend to develop problems that kill them young, even though uh, they're not natural sources of mortality. Also, I just wanted to point out at the top there, this paper was written by John Jett and Jeff Entry again, and they noticed that milestones are, are different in the wild in captivity. So 81% of wild orcas in the Pacific Northwest reach sexual maturity, but only four to 6% do in captivity. So they're dying younger, they're dying before sexual maturity more often in captivity. And then menopause, which is actually a very rare condition in species, 45% um, of females in the wild reach menopause. And that's probably around 45 years, 40 to 45 years of age. And then, you know, quite a few live longer. 
But in captivity, only 7%. In other words, Lolita, Tokate, uh, Corky, Kiska, Katina, they've all gone through menopause, so like four. And then there were a couple of others that did survive past menopause, but they are now dead, like um, Kasatka in uh, San Diego. Um, the most recent survivorship on um, survivorship, sorry, the most recent research on survivorship in bottlenose dolphins shows that, at the, again, this is from the captivity industry. Uh, Kelly Yakala is uh, is affiliated with the Dolphin Research Center in Florida. They found that dolphins in captivity um, in the best facilities, mind you, not just in any old, um, you know, like, sorry, <laughs> Miami Aquarium type facility, um, are surviving as well as highly urbanized dolphins. So the, the, the populations we have the best data from are from highly urbanized environments like Sarasota. You know, they, they, they are probably not doing, you know, the best that they could do if their habitat was pristine. And there are still some robust bottlenose dolphin populations in relatively pristine environments, but we just don't have the data from those populations. Nobody's studying them because they're not a conservation concern. So nobody's studying them. It's kind of a, um, you know, a, a catch 22 for researchers. So the best data we have on survivorship is from these highly urbanized dolphins because they are conservation concern. And that's how well captive dolphins survive. So it's the same conundrum that we're seeing with the larger species. They may be living as long as wild populations, but those wild populations are beleaguered. They are not, the best A plus populations to be comparing them to because they're living in these highly urbanized environments. They may not be in danger, they may not be threatened, but they're you know, not living as long as they might if they were living in a better environment. I hope that makes sense. Um, th this is what we're concerned about. Um, even when the industry is doing the research and trying to show that their dolphins are living as long as wild dolphins, the wild dolphins and wild cetaceans are comparing them to are in marginal habitat. Captures from the wild are still occurring. Um, the dry fishery, I'm wearing a cove t-shirt as you can see. Um, the dry fishery in Taiji, Japan still occurs every year. A lot of those dolphins go to Russia, China, and so on, um, as well as other countries in Asia. They don't come to the West anymore. There really isn't anywhere in the West that is taking these animals anymore. They've just gotten burned too much by this, this documentary and other sources of pressure. So um, all of the big zoo associations have have pledged not to take animals from the source anymore, but the East is, is full of facilities that are, are still buying these dolphins. So those captures are still occurring. Cubis had a capture operation going on for years. I actually think it's dried up a little bit. We haven't heard too much out of there and, and we've seen no trade on, in the CITES database, Convention on International Trade and Endangered Species uh, keeps a database of trade. You have to, these, all of these species are on appendix two, which means trade has to be monitored. So the, the, the database is, you know, obviously self-reported, so it, it's faulty, but it's pretty good for a general idea of what's going on. And Cuba hasn't exported any dolphins in about 12 years. So that's interesting. Um, they used to have this conveyor belt coming out of Cuba that went to other facilities in the Caribbean that went to um, Europe, everywhere. Um, but that's dried up. So again, I, I would call that a blackfish effect as well. You know, that documentary came out in 2013, a lot of things changed. Um, and then blue and orcas come out of Russia. And again, that, that's closed, okay? They were doing it up until 2018. Um, this is how they do it. It's very primitive and it's, it's, it's not, I, I'll just say it's traumatic. It's very traumatic for these animals. Aside from the fact that they're all young juveniles, you know, they're grabbing them by the tail. That's what's happening here. They actually have a, a soft rope around their tail stock. They're dragging them next to these boats. That's how they do it. it. They have no other abilities to do it any other way. And then they hold them in large numbers in these small pens, basically aquaculture fishnets, um, until they're ready for movement to a, a, a point of sale. Um, the last captures were in 2018. So it's been four years now since they've been out on the water. Um, this was due to a lot of public pressure. Some folks may be aware, sorry, some folks may be aware of the whale jail. Um, it got a lot of public um, attention through the internet. Social media has been an incredible boom to animal activism. Um, a lot of drone footage showing these animals in, in this enclosure that was called the whale jail that in Vladivostok, uh, near Vladivostok, I should say, it was actually not in that city, but it was nearby. And it was simply, uh, 
incredible. And in, in, in 2018, they caught 101 animals, 11 orcas and 90 belugas. It was just crazy, absolutely crazy. And there were just animals being held like uh, goldfish in a bowl uh, for, it turned out, for a whole season. They, they, they couldn't sell them because of the scandal. And so eventually most of them were released. Only four actually died. That's four too many, but you know, an amazingly low mortality rate considering the conditions they were being held in. Um, and then all of the others were released. None of them made it into trade. Uh, that was actually, again, a huge victory. Um, and it was all due to social media and the pressure that the public brought to bear on Mr. Putin um, at the time. And he's still there, of course, and now look what he's doing. So anyway. Um, the future for me is, you know, ending the breeding, ending the captures, and ending the live trade. It may result in animals that are currently in captivity staying there for the rest of their lives. We just have to face that. We will not find sanctuaries for all of them, um, but we'll do our best. But if we end the breeding, end captures, and end the live trade, then this would be the last generation. So, for example, we did that in Canada. They grandfathered in the existing um, animals, but they will be the last generation. In California, same thing with orcas. They have ended the breeding captures and trade of orcas in California, the state of California. The whales at SeaWorld will be the last generation of orcas in California. Um, that's what we're working toward everywhere that we're dealing with legislation. We're trying to pass laws, not that just end captivity overnight, because that's actually unrealistic. Where would they all go? We don't want to euthanize all of them. Believe me, we don't. These are sentient creatures who have choice. They are intelligent. They think, they plan, they anticipate. Killing them would be murder, right? So ending breeding, ending captures, ending live trade, and trying to improve their conditions, putting as many as we can in sanctuary, that's what I want to see. Improving facilities if it's possible. There are some where we could, they can do better. They're not doing anywhere near what they can do, and then we, they can do better. Um, sanctions were possible and release were possible. There are some individuals, all of the whales who were caught in that 2018 outrageously out of control capture in Russia, they were all, well, except for the four that died, released back into the wild. I don't know that they all survived because some of them were quite traumatized and were released in the wrong place. They were not released where they were captured. But some of them were returned to where they were captured and we have seen them since. We believe they're still alive. There have been releases in Korea where the animals have been in captivity for up to six years, but they were caught as adults and they were released where they were caught and they're all still alive. In fact, two of the females are reproducing. It's been about seven or eight years since they were released. It can be done with certain individuals. And so we will do that where we can. That's the future. And so I really hope that's what happens. Um, country by country, state by state, we'll see. You know. Um, we have to be realistic with our expectations. So that's it. Um, I'm always happy to answer questions. Um, so that's my email address. Please feel free to email me questions. I am very responsive to email. Um, I have a Facebook page called From the Dolphin's Point of View. Just, just you know, put that in the search uh, of Facebook and you'll find it. It's a, a community Facebook page and you're always welcome to follow me. And I answer DMs, you know, and if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. And I also have a Twitter account, but I'm pretty bad at that. So I have to confess that I'm not as active on Twitter um, professionally. I'm very active privately, but not very active professionally. Um, but I, I do try to certainly answer any DMs that come over my professional Twitter account. So I'm more than happy to take questions at this point. And I'll leave these up for, for another minute and then I'll stop sharing my screen. And we have some questions. Go for it. All right, the uh, one uh, quick one is what did stop the Russian uh, trade in 2018? Was it a parliamentary, you must, what, is it by law now? There, it is by law now. Um, orcas are now listed on the red list, which is their endangered species list. So they can't capture orcas by law. Um, belugas, it was a moratorium. That's, I'm concerned it's not permanent. Um, so we have to keep our eye on the beluga situation in Russia. But the orca situation is done and dusted. Of course, you know, yeah, yeah. it's Russia, so anything could change. But currently, the law right. is, uh, it is no longer legal to capture orcas. Another question has to do with you're wearing a COVA shirt. Yeah. And the question is, uh, what's going on with, the, with the, that horrible practice in Taiji? It, it, Taiji is still there, as I mentioned, um, you know, 
Taiji is still there and, and we're not um, having much of an impact other than on the demand. We're not cutting off the supply. At, for example, in Russia, we cut off the supply. There's still a demand, trust me, China wants yeah. Russian animals, but they can't get them anymore. If they don't breed them in China, they're, they're, they're gonna go out of business, which is great. And we're working on that. Um, but they can't, you know, we cut off the supply to China. So they either breed them in captivity or they're gonna go out of business. Um, in Japan, we need to cut off the demand because we've got had no traction with the supply. They, as you saw in the code, which is now of course 13 years old, they are extremely um, xenophobic. They do not like Gaijin. They do not want us there. They do not want to hear us. They do not want to talk to us. They do not want to negotiate. They do not want, foreigners are not allowed. Foreigners are not welcome. Um, and that's actually Japanese. Um, gaijin is a, is a pejorative word and it means foreigner and it, it's not nice. Um, and it's been like that since the 19th century. Um, well, before the 19th century, um, it, it, it was the hidden aisle, you know, you just, it was closed, it was closed society. And then after the 19th century, when it opened up, it didn't open up voluntarily. So um, they, they just don't like foreigners coming in and telling them what to do. It's the problem at the IWC, you know, when they, they finally left, of course. Um, and I'm, I'm half Japanese, so, you know, I, I, I understand their culture pretty well. My mother is Japanese. So, so you know, it, it, it's a problem with cultural differences. And getting mad at them and calling them names and, and being racist is not helpful. <laughs> you know, if you do want to actually ever reach them and have a, a sit down and actually negotiate a solution, you're never going to get there if you, if you just say they're evil and barbarians and all these other silly things, you know, because the fact is we do terrible things here in the United States all the time. Are we barbarians? Well, I think some of us are, but you know what I'm saying? It's, it's just cultural differences, right? Um, and that makes it difficult because one of their cultural cultural things is they don't like listening to foreigners. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's, it's a, it's an ongoing situation. Um, they are still in fact killing dolphins. I think uh, the, the hunting season is over, but it starts in November and it usually goes through about now, about till March or April. So, you know, it's, it's, it's a, a bad situation and it's still, and the market is still there, but it, we're shrinking it. That's our, our goal is to get at the demand, not, can't get it this far. Are there any um, uh, requirements, either domestic or overseas, for reporting uh, health or death of the uh, captive animals? No, not at all. Um, it's a country by country thing. The United States has a very uh, decent system. It's not flawless, but it's a decent system of keeping track of the inventory of captive whales and dolphins. Um, it's literally called that. It's called the National Inventory of Marine Mammals. It's by law, it's uh, under the National the, uh, Marine Mammal Protection Act. Um, facilities have to alert the, the federal agencies that an animal has been born, has died, or has been transferred. They have to keep that inventory up to date um, on a 30 day basis. So when the disposition of an animal changes, it's born, it's died, it's been moved, within 30 days, you have to um, alert the government that you've done that, that, this, that that has happened. So the inventory is what can be pretty up to date. Sorry? Sorry, Bob? Uh, what can be done to uh, end the captive, captive breeding? Oh, what can be done to end the captive breeding? Um, well, that's what we're trying to do is pass legislation that requires it to end. You know, we're, we're actually trying to pass at any level, um, municipal, state, national. Um, we did it at the state level in California for orcas. We did it at the uh, federal level in Canada for all species and so on. So we just trying, there's several um, municipalities or counties in the United States that don't allow uh, captive display or breeding. Um, South Carolina doesn't allow the captive display, display of, of cetaceans. So that's a state level statute. So, you know, there's several, Barcelona just decided not to display dolphins anymore in, in Spain. You know, so we're working on it at every level that we can to pass laws that prohibit the breeding of these animals. Regarding some of the behavior problems of the cetaceans, uh, any possibility of the, uh, the USDA um, 
uh, having in great having greater enrichment uh, regulations. So, in twenty sixteen, remember what happened in twenty sixteen? There was an election. In 2016, um, the Animal and Plant Health Inspection Service, which is the USDA agency responsible for, for regulating the care and maintenance of these animals in captivity, they issued a proposed rule to update the regulations, the Animal Welfare Act regulations that govern how they're, how they're held. Um, we put together a lengthy comment during the public comment period as to how this proposed rule was not enough, that it needs to be better and stronger and more comprehensive. So we gave them a very clear roadmap to how to make the, the regulations better and not adequate. Remember, I'm just talking about improved facilities if possible and understanding that there's a limit, um, but better than they are now. The standards right now are wholly inadequate. So we issued those comments, um, comment period closed, and then the election happened. And within a very short period of time, like say two months, that proposed rule was shelved. It just was killed. It didn't move forward. Um, and so for four years, we waited for another election to see if we could get that process moving again. And we did, right? 2020 came along. We have a different administration now. And that process will start up again. Interestingly, because of the, the, the long time lag, right, four years, five years, really, um, they just withdrew the proposed rule entirely. They didn't start restart the process with the original proposed rule. They just pulled the proposed rule completely and they're starting over from scratch. And that's actually better because seriously, the proposed rule was completely inadequate. And so we will see a new proposed rule with what we hope are better proposals soon. Soon is relative. I don't know how soon is soon is. Thank you, Susan. Any closing comments? I think we have just a few more questions, Bob. Maybe just um, one question: Are there examples of suicide among captive populations? Um, that's an interesting question. I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Um, that's an interesting question. Um, I think they're capable of it. Yes, um, they are self-aware. They understand death. They are um, thinking, feeling creatures, uh, you know, beings. They are beings. Uh, you know, you've heard the phrase "non-human person." I think they are non-human persons. Uh, whether they ever legally will be non-human persons, I don't know, but they should be. Um, so I think they can commit suicide. Have they? Um, I'm I'm a scientist. I I need you know pretty clear data before I'm going to say this is what just happened. I mean, in fact, I hear a lot of times people say, look at this video. I get videos all the time. People send me videos and say, look at what this dolphin is doing. Isn't it X, Y, or Z? And I'm like, I, I, I don't see that. I don't see what you're telling me you see. You, you see it because you're, you're interpreting what you're seeing in this video from a human lens. And I'm trying to look at it from the dolphin's point of view. Remember, that's the name of my um, Facebook page for a reason. I'm trying to get people to see things from the dolphin's point of view. And that's actually hard. We're not dolphins. Like I said, we're pretty stupid dolphins. And so seeing it from their point of view is difficult, but it is what we should all strive to do. And so, you know, basically, um, I think that some suicides have happened, but I wouldn't be able to tell you which ones they were. For example, everybody thinks Hugo, the orca that lived with Lolita back in the day, he died in 1980. Everybody thinks he committed suicide. Because he did, in fact, bash himself up against the wall of the tank until he died. Turns out he had an aneurysm. And so he probably had an absolutely outrageously horrible headache, like, like a pain in his brain that drove him mad. Um, and he couldn't, he couldn't stop it. And so he banged his head against the wall because of the pain and it killed him. But did, what, is that suicide? You know, I, I don't know. I don't know if that's what he meant. I don't know if he meant to kill himself is sort of what I'm saying. Um, but he did in fact kill himself because bashing his head against the wall of the tank did that to him with aneurysm. But intention is important and I don't know. You know, most animals will do anything to stay alive. You know, they'll chew off their own paw in a steel, steel 
jaw leg hole trap to, to stay alive and to get up, get away. I think life, you know, they're less afraid of death and they're also less afraid of life. You know, that's how I feel about it. I mean, I, I don't presume to know what they're thinking, but I think thinking they think like we do, it does them a disservice. So. Yeah, interesting. Uh, we have a question on um, what sanctuaries look like. And uh, this might be a good time to mention that um, uh, Howard Garrett from Orca Network will be speaking in May. Um, so, so is the question, what will sanctuaries look like? Yeah. Yeah. Um, all I can tell you is what our sanctuary will look like. I'm on the board of directors of the Whale Sanctuary Project. And um, it, it took us a long time to find a good location. Um, that's part of the problem. I think good real estate for these facilities is actually in short supply. Uh, sea pen facilities, dolphinariums, sea pen dolphinariums are built all over the world. There's tons of them all over the world. Uh, but they're in actually terrible locations, like the, the one I was just describing in St. Thomas. You know, They built it in a body of water that doesn't pass its Clean Water Act standards 40% of the year. You know, they never should have been allowed to build a, a sea pen in that body of water. So, you know, we could pick up any location. There's lots of locations to build a sea pen facility, but not safe, clean, uh, good, good weather. You know, like hurricanes are probably a bad idea and so on. And so we, we searched for a very long time and we found a location in Nova Scotia. It's relatively protected. It's, you know, it doesn't have a lot of other marine wild, um, marine mammal wildlife around so that we wouldn't be impacting on any other um, local wild populations. Um, right whales don't come in, so we wouldn't be hurting right whales and so on. And so we actually searched on Google Maps, you know, we started with, I think it was something like 600 locations and we boiled down to one. And it was actually, there were two, but you know, this one was clearly the, the front runner. So um, I don't know how many sanctuaries there ever will be. Maybe not that many, because unlike a, a terrestrial sanctuary where you know you just buy the land and then you build a sanctuary on it, uh, land ownership is a thing almost everywhere you go. Um, marine ownership is not a thing. Um, in most places, you can't even own beachfront, although there are a few places where you can. But you know, public access to beaches is actually a pretty big thing in most parts of the world. Um, and certainly, the water is maritime passageway. You know, it, it belongs to the country. The government of you know that it's part of and so you know three miles offshore you know is 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 the you know the, the water that belongs directly to the party on the beach and then 200 miles offshore belongs to the government and so you cannot just build anything anywhere you want to in the water the way you can't buy a bit of the ocean and build anything you want to you have to get permission and so obviously lots of things get permission um, marinas, beachfront property developments, um, you know, and dolphinariums, aquaculture, you know, lots of things get permission to do it, but you do have to get permission. And so um, where can we get permission to build a large facility? Because it that's the biggest thing is it has to give them more space than, than a tank is going to do, or there's no point to it, because that's what a dolphinarium does, the sea pen dolphinarium. They just basically build a tank sized thing in the water, you know, so it's better acoustically, certainly it's better, um, but it might be in a polluted body of water, it might be in a really noisy body of water where ships and boats go by all the time. It's not, it's good for tourist traffic, but not necessarily a good place to live with the dolphins. So we need to find a good location that's, you know, good for the animals and also that we can get permission to use. Um, so it's really, in the end, I'm not sure we're going to find a lot of locations around the world like that. Um, and so, if we have to compromise on size, you know, we want it, ours to be 100 acres, and it will be. But you know, what if it had to be only 40 acres? That's still big. It's certainly bigger than any tank, but we wouldn't be able to put many animals in it and make it sense, you know, commonsensical for, you know, how much space each animal gets. You know, we want to make sure that we don't put, you know, 40 animals into a 40-acre space. There's no point in that. Um, so again, I'm not sure. I think in the end, the solution is going to be that a lot of these animals are going to have to stay where they are. Wow. Uh, we can improve their conditions. We make sure they aren't bred so that they attrit, you know, there's attrition and eventually they're the last generation. But 
are we going to be able to move them all to sanctuaries? That's just not a realistic goal. Yeah, that'll be a, definitely an area to continue to to watch and you know have that evolve. I I, I, I wanted to. There's a there's a question here. A couple questions that I can see in the Q and A that I'd like yeah. to address. If that's okay with you, please. Okay, so the Miami situation. I just want to quickly uh, clarify that um, Tokate is currently in legal limbo because um, she's not covered by the AD, AWA at the moment because um, the Animal Welfare Act, um, she's not covered by that at the moment because the uh, agency that's responsible for implementing the AWA has issued a license to the new owner of the Miami Aquarium that does not cover her. So um, if you go to my uh, Facebook page that I, I mentioned uh, from the Dolphin's point of view and you see my latest blog, I occasionally blog, mostly I just post things you know, that are interesting, news, newsworthy. But I actually blog every once in a while. So I just wrote a blog a few days ago. And if you go and look for that, you'll see what I, what, that's the Miami Aquarium situation. She is in legal limbo. She's not covered by the AWA at the moment, which is totally weird. Uh, she is covered by the Endangered Species Act because she's a member of the Southern Resident Killer Whale Population. But she's also not covered by the Marine Mammal Protection Act because she's pre-act. She was caught in 1970 and the law was passed in 1972. The, the Pacific White-Sided Dolphin that is with her, um, Lee, who is a male uh, wild caught lag, uh, Lagonorhynchus, he is actually also currently illegal. Uh, he's not covered by the AWA and that is not legal under the MMPA. Um, so it's all very complicated legally and regulatorily. And I do urge everybody who's really interested in the issue to read my blog uh, because I try to explain it in the simplest terms. But the fact is, is that both of them are in legal limbo at the moment. And um, it's not a good situation from that perspective. It's setting a precedent that's very dangerous for all the other facilities that are out there and all the other animals they care for. Um, for Lolita though, for Tokate, that legal limbo actually opens a window of opportunity to try to change her circumstances because her circumstances are terrible. You know, she's been in that horrible little tank. You saw it on the picture I showed, you know, for 52 years. So if we can take advantage of this window of opportunity and change her circumstances for the better, I'm all for that. But the fact is, is that currently she is in fact in legal limbo and that's not good for anybody. You know, um, uh, other animals, we don't want them in legal limbo either. You know, it's, we can't always rely on the owners of these facilities to be good hearted and want to do the right thing. The dolphin company who's just bought the Miami Aquarium does seem to want to help her because in fact, I think, you know, they're dolphin company, you know, having an orca is not really their thing. They don't have any other facility with orcas or belugas. They just have bottlenose dolphins. So I think they would have preferred that she not be there anymore, but they don't really know what to do with her. And, you know, they don't really know who to talk to, to get her into the right situation. So um, maybe that leads it's all in flux. Yeah. It's all in flux. Maybe that leads to the question, a very good question of what we can do. What, what can any of us do besides not going to the yeah you know, I saw that question too um to these places. so yeah what I would suggest um is you know talking to your local uh politicians you know see if you can get for example like I said at the municipal level preventing you know pro prohibiting the public display of, of of whales and dolphins is perfectly legal um, the federal law tends to preempt local law, except when it says it doesn't. And the Animal Welfare Act does not preempt local law. You can't be any, you can't pass a local law that's weaker than the Animal Welfare Act, but you can pass any law you want to that's stronger. That's how the California law got passed. It's much stronger than the Animal Welfare Act, and that's totally legal. A municipality can pass a law, a local law that's totally stronger than the Animal Welfare Act, that's totally legal. So I actually, you know, would urge people if they really want to do something, even if there's no hope in hell that there's ever going to be a dolphinarium built in your municipality, pass a law that prohibits it. It starts momentum. It tell it 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 becomes an example. I mean, South Carolina actually passed its its state law um, when there was a proposal to build a dolphinarium in South Carolina. So that was really what motivated them to pass this law, and that's great. But for example, Malibu pass a local statute, a, la a local ordinance that prohibits um, the public display of orcas. It, it had absolutely no impact. Nobody was gonna build an, a dolphinarium in you know, Malibu, but it made a statement. And so you know, if, we, if we end up with a hundred municipalities that all prohibit the public display of cetaceans, you know, that'll tell national leaders you know, a story. You know, and, and maybe they'll finally pass a federal law, for example. 
And, and so, you know, it's, it, the momentum is on our side. That's how I feel about it. I mean, you know, we, we, we crested a hill that I, I took 25 years to get up and now we're on the other side of it. And, you know, we are gaining momentum and it, it's, it's a bit scary as again, we don't really want to shut these places down. I mean, some of you may, I don't know. I don't want to shut them down. I just want them to change their business model. Um, I don't want them to be exploiting wildlife anymore. That's all. You know, I just don't think that's the way to go in the future. You know, zoos and because aquariums are not, are not arcs. They're not Noah's Ark. You know, we, we're not going to save them that way. Because if you shut them down, you're worried that it would be, they would be. Using I'm going to have how many animals that, you know, oh, are going to have okay. to have homes, you know, and I, I don't have homes for all of them. Um, I want them to stay in business. I want them to change their business model. And I want them to care for the animals they have until they're gone. Um, and like I said, for those that we have, we can do something for, we'll do that, that, you know, whatever that may be, sanctuary, improving their conditions, you know, releasing them if it's possible. Um, and again, the release option is very limited. There's only a few animals that, that um, what do you call it, that qualify, that are candidates for release, but, you know, they, they do exist because there's been a, a few recent captures. Well, we're coming down to the uh, the time limit here, but this has been fantastic. And you know, maybe the the very last question, Naomi, is what keeps you going? You know, I mean, <laughs> um, you know, I've had I've had moments <laughs> when I have felt really quite um, what's the word? Uh, not defeated. I've never felt defeated, but I've had moments where I've been pretty unclear on what I'm doing, you know, I'm just like, why am I still doing this? I, you know, I, I don't deserve this stress or whatever, you know, I just, you know, it's, it, you get depressed every once in a while. Um, but generally speaking, you know, I'll tell you, this is going to sound really big headed, but it's absolutely what keeps me going. We're right. Yeah. We're in the right. It, it's not appropriate to keep wide ranging green predators or wide ranging predators of any kind um, in confined spaces. It's not appropriate. And again, I'm not even saying it's unethical or it's evil or anything. It's just not appropriate. Biologically, not appropriate yeah. to keep wide ranging predators in confined spaces. So that's right. I don't need a ton of, you know, persuasion and data and, you know, science. It's just correct. <laughs> We're right. And, you know, I'm, I'm working for the day when that isn't something we do anymore, that we don't keep wide ranging predators in combined spaces, you know, and again, you know, if, if that's the only option, if, if we do actually have to turn zoos and aquariums into Noah's arcs, and the only place that these animals are going to survive is in a zoo or an aquarium, well, then they're gone. They're functionally extinct. And that is happening. They actually tried, some of you may be familiar with what happened to the vaquita. Okay, it's going extinct as we speak, it's disappearing as we speak. And they tried to put some of them in captivity, not in a tank somewhere, in a in a sanctuary, basically, in a in a natural enclosure, you know, a sea pen that would keep them in their natural habitat to keep them from being killed in the in the gillnets that are killing them while they tried to deal with the gillnet problem. It made all the sense in the world. It was completely logical and it was totally wrong. Because they tried to capture them and they just keeled over and died. Yeah. Because some species, that's what they do. You've got the bottlenose dolphin that's, you know, relatively robust. It tends to handle all the, excuse my French, crap that we throw at it pretty well. All right. And still, it's not thriving in captivity. It's just coping better than all the other species in captivity. But there are some species, and it's not just the vaquita. There's a few others, you know, where you just look at them cross-eyed and they, they just die. Yeah. And they handled these two vaquita that died as if they were bottlenose dolphins. It was crazy to me. I mean, when I saw the, the video of it, I was just like, you've got to be kidding me. And they went completely berserk. They smashed themselves up against the sea pen they were being held in and they rolled over and died. Well, one of them did and the other one was released before it yeah. did that, but it wobbled off, you know, and I don't think it survived. So we are never going to save these animals by being Noah's Ark. And anybody who makes that argument is full of it. If they are not subject to natural selection, then they are not evolving. And they will be dependent on us into you know, eternity and that they have no biological value. Again, I'm a scientist. I believe in ecosystem you know, preservation. 
if they have no natural function because they're only in a, a, a cage somewhere, then they are functionally extinct. That's what happened to the passenger, passenger pigeon. You know, the last one was in a zoo. Yeah. She died and that was the end of the passenger pigeon. She had no value. She had no value for, the, for her entire life. She lived for, I don't remember how many years, but she was the last passenger pigeon the whole time she was alive pretty much. And she had no value whatsoever, except to herself. And she was in a cage. So that's not so much value even to herself. So we either save them in their natural habitat or they're not gonna be saved. And that's a tough sell because some of these species are going to be lost, no doubt about it. They're being lost. We're losing the vaquita as we speak. We lost the baiji, but they're not gonna be saved by putting them in a box. Well, you've given us so much uh, good information and the proof points of um, why they're, 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 they're not meant to be in ca captivity. So thank you so much for all your work. Thank you for this fantastic presentation. And I'm going to stop the recording now. And uh, it's always 